Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, where we take up important articles of the day from the newspaper and discuss them in detail as per the demands of civil services exam. Articles covered today are displayed on your screen and their notes in PDF and Word format are provided in the description box down below. Without further ado, let us begin. Now starting off with the first article of the day, which appeared on page 14 of today's Hindu newspaper. Over the last 15 days, the retail price of tomato has crossed rupees 60 per kilogram in many towns and cities. And yesterday, it was selling for more than rupees 100 per kilogram in many places. And the traders and growers do not expect the price to fall anytime soon. Now, India grows two major crops of tomatoes. The Rabi crop, which is grown mainly in Junar Taluka of Maharashtra, and in parts of Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh, comes in market between the months of March and August. And after August, the market is supplied by Kharif crop, which is grown in Uttar Pradesh and Nashik in Maharashtra. About 5 lakh hectares of farmland come under Rabi tomato, whereas 8 to 9 lakh hectares come under Kharif crop on an average. Hence, Price fluctuation of tomato, onion and potatoes have been a major issue in this country. In this regard, this topic is important from UPSC point of view. As in Maine's GS Paper 3, UPSC highlights transport and marketing of agriculture produce and issues and related constraints. As you can see, in the previous year question of Maine's 2020, a question appeared on main constraints in transport and marketing of agriculture produce in India. Whereas, in prelims of the year 2017, a question appeared on national agriculture market scheme. Hence, in the scope for today's discussion, we will first take a look at the reasons for this price rise. Following which, we will discuss the government interventions in this regard. Moving forward, we will discuss what are the way ahead for improvement of demand and supply of TOP crops in this country. Now, to start off our discussion, let us discuss factors that affect the price of tomato in our country. The first factor that affects price of tomato in our country is seasonality of the crops. The Rabi crop, as we have established, comes between the month of March and August. And after August, market is supplied by Kharif crop. And if there is a difference in productivity in any of these crops, this leads to supply glut in the market and hence the price of tomato rises. The second cause is attributed to natural factors. The reason for current high prices can be traced back to unusual heat in the month of March and April, which also led to pest attacks and it took a toll on total production of tomato crop. Further, monsoon dependency and weather-induced harvest losses are also causes for decline in production of tomato crop. Further, there is a phenomena called cobweb phenomena. And this phenomena is where price of certain goods witness fluctuations that are cyclical in nature. And it happens due to faulty producer expectations. The producer of agriculture goods, for example, might decide to increase their output one year because their product commanded a very high price in the previous year. This, however, might lead to overproduction and cause prices to slump that year, leading to losses. Similarly, reverse happened in the case of tomato this year. This reason for current high price can be traced back to sudden fall in prices in the month of April and May, which led many growers to abandon the tomato crops. Hence, cobweb phenomena is a major factor that has led to increase in price of tomato. Further, there is an issue related with price forecasting as it has proven to be inadequate and has led to suboptimal production of tomatoes in the country. Further, there is an effect called cascading effect which means there are multiple intermediaries in the supply chain for tomatoes which lead to various levi of charges. Hence, 
the prices which are paid by consumers grow many a times and leads to increase in tomato prices also there is an issue related to inadequate infrastructure in the country which leads to high transportation costs lack of storage facility and lack of food processing facilities this has led to inadequate storage of tomatoes when the supply of tomatoes are high and hence the supply of tomatoes cannot be met in case the supply reduces in the market now let us discuss what are the interventions that the government has taken in order to stabilize the prices of tomatoes in the country the first is that government has imposed export restrictions by stopping the exports the government expects the supply of domestic tomato should be met in the national market itself further government also imposes stock limits on traders under essential commodities act of the year 1955 and prevention of black marketing and maintenance of supplies of essential commodities act of 1980 this imposes stock limits on the traders further government undertakes distribution of tomatoes through organized chains such as mother dairy and suffal outlets also government undertakes tax raids on traders which prevents traders from taking undue benefits by increasing the cost of tomatoes in the markets further government imports from international markets in case the supply of tomatoes reduces in our country as we have seen in the case of onions onions was imported from turkey in order to increase the supply of onions in the national markets further government has established a price stabilization fund which regulates the price volatility of horticultural commodities in country further government introduced operation greens which aims to enhance the production and reduce volatility further it also promotes farmer producer organizations agri logistics and processing facilities the scope of this scheme initially was for tomatoes onions and potatoes however recently the scope of this scheme was expanded to all crops that is total crops last the government also monitors the prices of essential commodities which includes tomato and 21 other commodities and these commodities are tracked by consumer affairs department of ministry of consumer affairs and it is done in order to make effective interventions now what should be the way forward in order to stabilize the prices of tomatoes in a country let us take a look in the next slide the first measure that the government should undertake is to rationalize the price stabilization system by doing so government agencies such as nafed can procure at least 2 to 3 tons of rabi harvest at the time when there's a lot of supply in the market and these tomatoes can be introduced in the market when there's an increased demand of tomatoes during the monsoon period further government should also introduce price deficiency payment system where private procurers can procure tomatoes from the farmers and the difference in prices can be met by a government subsidy and it should be implemented on all india basis further there is a need for technological driven price forecasting system which should take prices of all the major markets in the country into consideration and then transmit these prices to farmers on a daily or fortnight basis further there is a need to encourage food processing in order to promote use of dehydrated tomatoes and other tomato products as well this will increase the shelf life of tomatoes and hence will reduce the price volatility of tomatoes further there is a need to invest in storage infrastructure and agri logistics which will then have a multiplier effect on the agriculture marketing system in the country these suggestions was also made by shanta kumar committee further there is a need for cluster approach in agro processing which will help stabilize the demand supply equation on a regional basis hence there would not be a price difference when you compare prices for example in maharashtra than that with prices in 
Uttar Pradesh. Hence, the prices of tomatoes in general are important from a consumer's point of view, as it is a commodity which is used daily in our kitchens. Thus, the government has made efforts by introducing price stabilization fund, operation greens and undertaking price monitoring of tomatoes in the country. Further, by rationalizing price stabilization system, introducing price deficiency payment system, encouraging food processing, undertaking storage infrastructure and agri-logistics improvement and cluster approach for agri-processing, the country can aim to reduce the price volatility of tomatoes in our agriculture markets. This is all for today's discussion on tomato price rise. Now moving on to the second article of the day which also appeared on page 14 of today's Hindu newspaper. Now the Vande Bharat trains have emerged as a potential game changer in the Indian railway system as these trains offer high speed and comfortable travel experience to the passengers. With modern design, indigenous manufacturing and an emphasis on make in India initiatives, these trains showcase India's technological advancements. These trains are self-propelled in nature and they do not require an engine. Further, these trains are embedded with 360 degree rotating seats, have AC chair car type configuration, in addition to having diffuse lighting, automatic doors and footsteps. Further, these trains are enriched with GPS based information system and CCTV cameras in addition to Wi-Fi facilities. However, the expansion of Vande Bharat trains face certain challenges. First of which is that they have failed to live up to promise of expected speeds. The railway development efforts to undertake development of Indian railways are important from UPSC point of view. As UPSC in GS paper 3 mentions infrastructure with special emphasis on railways. This can be also seen from previous year question of the year in mains 2022 where a question appeared on redevelopment of railway stations through private partnership model. Further, in prelims of the year 2015, a question appeared on reference to bio toilets used by Indian railways. Hence, in the scope of today's discussion, we will first take a look on what are the benefits that are offered by Vande Bharat trains. Further, we will also discuss challenges that the network expansion of Vande Bharat faces. In the end, we will discuss the measures that should be undertaken in order to further expand the Vande Bharat trains network in the country. Let us first discuss what are the benefits that these trains offer. The first benefit that these trains offer is that they provide semi-high speed travel. Now Vande Bharat trains are India's first semi-high speed trains and these are designed to operate at speeds up to 180 km per hour. The aerodynamic design helps these train reach 0 to 100 in 52 seconds, which is faster than other trains in Indian Railways network. And these design allows for faster travel times and improved connectivity in between Indian cities. Also, these trains are an example of indigenous manufacturing. The Vande Bharat trains are manufactured in India and hence showcases country's capability in complex manufacturing. These trains are produced in Indian Integral Coach Factory in Chennai and promotes Make in India initiative, further supporting the growth of domestic manufacturing sector. Also, these trains shows technological advancements as Vande Bharat trains incorporate advanced technologies and modern features to enhance passenger comfort and safety. These include features like automatic doors, regenerative braking and state-of-the-art passenger amenities. Also, development of these trains have provided India with national and international recognition. As demands for these trains have emerged from Europe and African nations as well. These trains have showcased India's capability in manufacturing and implementing cutting-edge railway technology, thereby reinforcing the country's position as a global player in railway industry. Also, these trains are an avenue for employment generation. 
as manufacturing operation and maintenance of Vande Bharat trains generates employment opportunities, which includes skilled labor in manufacturing units, onboard train staff and stationary personnel contributing to job creation and economic growth of Indian economy. Further, these trains exhibit energy efficiency, as Vande Bharat trains are designed to be energy efficient, thereby contributing to environmental conservation and sustainability. These trains utilize regenerative braking, which helps the efficient use of energy and reduces the carbon emissions from railway travel. Also, these trains offer improved passenger experience, as these trains offer a comfortable and modern travel experience for passengers with features like ergonomic setting, Wi-Fi connectivity, GPS-based passenger information system, and modular toilets. Now, what are the challenges that the Indian Railway faces in expanding the network of one-day Bharat trains in the country? Let us take a look in the next slide. The first challenge pertains to sanctions in the international relations. The ongoing sanctions imposed on Russia following the Russia-Ukraine war have posed challenges for Vande Bharat trains. These sanctions have affected the supply of spare parts from Eastern European and Russian manufacturers, thereby hindering the smooth operation and maintenance of these trains. Further, the expansion of these trains faces a shareholding dispute, as there is a disagreement between Russian transportation giant TNH and the Indian public sector undertaking Railway Vigas Nigam Limited regarding the majority shareholding issue for the joint venture to manufacture Vande Bharat train sets in India. And these disputes have led to delays and uncertainty in expansion of Vande Bharat rail network. Further, Vande Bharat faces production delays and shortfalls as Integrated Coach Factory, which is responsible for manufacturing Vande Bharat trains, has faced several challenges in meeting production targets. Shortage of raw materials, supply chain disruptions and delay in approval of designs has resulted in factory's failure to deliver the targeted number of trains, thereby leading to delays in expansion of the network. Also, there are operational and maintenance cost related challenges as operating and maintaining Vande Bharat trains involve significant costs which includes training of the staff, ensuring spare parts availability and implementing regular maintenance schedules. Hence, managing these costs while ensuring efficient operation and high quality services pose a challenge on the expansion process. Further, there is a challenge related to passenger demand and occupancy. While Vande Bharat trains have been popular among the passengers. Managing the demand and ensuring optimal capacity utilization is a challenging affair. Balancing the number of trains and frequencies with the passenger demand requires careful planning and analysis. Also, there are weather related operational challenges. As operating Vande Bharat trains in populated areas and challenging weather, such as monsoon season or on steep gradients can pose operational challenges. Hence, special considerations and precautions needs to be taken care of in order to ensure trains safe and reliable operations under such conditions. Then a question may arise that what should be done in order to expand the network of Vande Bharat trains which has proved to be a game changer in the Indian railway network. Let us take a look in the next slide. The first suggestion pertains to resolution of shareholding dispute, which occurred between parties of Russian TNH and Indian Rail Vigas Nigam Limited. And both parties should work on resolving the majority shareholding dispute in the joint venture. By finding a mutually acceptable solution, it will help establish clarity and facilitate smoother progress in manufacturing and expansion of Vande Bharat trains network. Also, there is a need to mitigate the impact of sanctions. Hence, effort should be made in order to mitigate the impact of sanctions which are imposed on Russia by diversifying the supply chain for spare parts. 
exploring alternative supply from countries which are unaffected by these sanctions can ensure consistent availability of necessary components for Vande Bharat trains. Also, there is a need to strengthen manufacturing capabilities. As the integrated coach factory in Chennai and other relevant manufacturing units should focus on enhancing their production capacities and streamlining the production process. These includes addressing issues related to raw material availability, supply chain management and timely approval of designs to meet the production targets and support the expansion plans. Also, there is a need for continuous training and skill development. The training programs should be conducted for staff who are involved in operation, maintenance and servicing of Vande Bharat trains. Continuous skill development and knowledge enhancement will ensure that the workforce is equipped to handle the advanced technology and provide efficient services. Also, there is a need for effective demand management. A comprehensive analysis of passenger demand patterns should be conducted in order to optimize the train frequencies, train routes and capacity of each trains. Also, there is a need to incorporate weather resilient designs. Considering the challenges which are posed on operation of these trains, thereby there is a need to incorporate weather resilient designs and features, which will enhance the train's operational reliability. These include addressing the concerns related to water logging, ensuring safety during monsoons and facilitating smooth operations on steep gradients. Thereby, resolution of shareholding disputes, mitigating international sanctions, strengthening the manufacturing capacity, undertaking training and skill development of the workforce, effective demand management and incorporating resilient designs can help railway improve the Vande Bharat trains and increase the network of Vande Bharat trains in the country. Now moving on to the third article of the day which appeared on page 16 of today's Hindu newspaper. Now this article reports that the current account deficit of our country has narrowed in the quarter fourth of this year as well as the trade deficit has also shrinked. Now this topic that is external sector is important from UPSC point of view because UPSC in GS paper 3 asks effects of liberalization on the Indian economy. Also, this topic appeared in mains of the year of 2015 as a question appeared on surge in import of gold and its impact on India's balance of payment. Similarly, in prelims of the year 2014, a question appeared on balance of payment and its components. Now this article throws at us certain keywords which are current account deficit, trade deficit and transfer payments. What are these keywords? Let us take a look in the theory of balance of payments. After understanding the theory, we will take a look at components of balance of payments followed by which we will discuss the nature of today's article. In the end, we will discuss the initiatives that the government has taken in order to promote exports which will eventually narrow down our current account deficit. Hence, let us start off with theory of balance of payments. Now balance of payments records the transaction in goods, services and assets between residents of a country and the rest of the world for a specified period of time, which is typically one year. Now. There are two main accounts in balance of payments. The first is current account and the second is capital account. First, let us discuss current account. This current account is a record of trade in goods, services and transfer payments. Trade in goods includes exports and imports of goods, whereas trade in services includes factor income and non-factor income. While Transfer payments are the receipts which the residents of a country get for free. That means without having to provide any goods or services in return. These consists of gifts, remittances and grants. These transfer payments could be given by the government or by private citizens living abroad. Therefore, buying goods is expenditure from our country 
and it becomes income of that foreign country. Similarly, selling of foreign goods or exports brings income to our country. Now this current account is in balance when receipts equal payments. While a surplus in current account means that a nation is lender to other countries. That means receipts are more than the payments. On the other hand, deficit in the current account means that the current account receipts are less than current account payments made to other countries. Now let us understand what is balance of trade. Balance of trade is the difference between value of exports and value of imports of goods of a country in a given period of time. Export of goods is entered as a credit item in the balance of trade, whereas imports is added as a debit to the account of balance of trade. The balance of trade is in balance when exports of goods equal imports of goods, whereas on the similar way a surplus balance of trade means that exports of a country are more than imports, whereas deficit balance of trade means that imports of a country are greater than exports of this country. Now, after understanding what is current account, let us take a look on what is capital account. Now, capital account records all international transactions of assets. An asset is one of the form in which wealth can be held. For example, money, stocks, bonds, government debts, etc. Purchase of assets is a debit item on capital account. On the other hand, sale of assets like that of shares of an Indian company to for example an American company is a credit on capital account. Capital account consists of investments which can be direct investments like FDI or portfolio investments like foreign institutional investments. It also consists of external borrowings such as external commercial borrowings by private sector companies. It also includes external assistance which can be in a form of government aid or multilateral or bilateral loans. Now a capital account is in balance where capital inflows equals capital outflows. On the other hand, surplus in capital account means that capital inflows are greater than capital outflows. whereas Deficit in the capital account means that capital inflows are lesser than capital outflows in a given period of time that is one year. The essence of international payments is that just like an individual. When an individual spends more than his income, he must finance the difference by selling assets or borrowing money. Thereby, in a similar relation, a country that has a deficit in its current account must balance it by selling its assets or by borrowing from abroad. This means any deficit in the current account must be financed by a capital account surplus, that is a net capital inflow. For this, the country could use its reserve of foreign exchanges in order to balance the deficit in balance of payments. The Reserve Bank of India sells foreign exchange when there is a current account deficit and this is also known as official reserve sale. Now, after understanding the basics of balance of payment, let us take a look on what this article highlights. This article primarily highlights that India's current account deficit has narrowed down to 0.2% of its GDP in the fourth quarter of financial year of 2023. This sequential decline was mainly because of moderation in our trade deficit and which was coupled by robust revenue from services export. Also, the net services receipts in a country has increased both on sequential and on year-to-year -year basis, which is due to rise in net earnings from computer services. While on the other hand, private transfer receipts, which mainly accounts for remittances by Indians who are employed abroad, also rose by 20%. Further, the net foreign direct investment that is FDI, was higher than previous quarter. Also, it is expected that there will be further improvement in our current account deficit as both exports and import values are expected to soften because of weak external demand and lower international commodity prices. This will lead to further narrowing of goods trade deficit. 
Also, there is expected to be a large boost, which will come from robust services trade surplus, as highlighted in this article. Further, to reduce the current account deficit, government has taken many initiatives to promote exports from the country. What are these initiatives? Let us take a look in the next slide. The first initiative is known as India Exports Initiative, which is aimed to increase MSME exports by 50%. It also features an information portal, which will serve as a knowledge base for exports by Indian MSME. With the required information related to export potential markets as well as trends in exports, etc. The second initiative, the government has undertaken capital infusion in the Export Credit Guarantee Corporation, which was set up in the year of 1957 to promote exports by providing credit risk insurance and related services for exports. Also, government has started production linked incentive scheme for 14 high potential sectors which includes auto, battery cell, pharmaceuticals, telecom networking, food and textiles and it is done in order to promote their manufacturing. Also, Niti Aayog has recently released Export Preparedness Index which discusses the export potential of each state and the role of regional level economies in enhancing India's share in global trade. Further, National Logistics Policy was introduced, which aims to create a single window e-logistics market, which will further cut down logistics cost from 13 to 14% to 10% of India's GDP. Also recently, the Foreign Trade Policy of the year 2023 was introduced, which has four pillars and all are aimed to increase exports of our country. Further, there will be continuance of National Export Insurance Account and infusion of 1650 crores over five years of time until the year 2025-26. And it will help the exporters to tap the potential of project exports in focus market and will enhance manufacturing in India. Hence, these initiatives are aimed to increase exports on our country, which will further narrow down the current account deficit, hence improving our country's balance of payments. Now moving on to the fourth article of the day, which appeared on page 13 of today's Hindu newspaper. This article highlights that the Election Commission of India has recently announced election to 10 Raj Sabha seats, which is from three different states which are about to fall vacant in July and August. Now, Raj Sabha is the upper house to the Indian Parliament and it is important from both federal and legislative purposes. It is also important from UPSC perspective as UPSC in GS Paper 2 highlights Parliament and its structure. Further, in previous year question of the year 2020, a question appeared in mains on Raj Sabha role as a supporting organ in past few decades. Further, in prelims of the year 2015, a question appeared on Raj Sabha power vis-a-vis -vis passage of bills in the parliament. Hence, in the scope of today's discussion, first, we will take a look on composition of Raj Sabha. Then, we will discuss the process for elections to the Raj Sabha. Further, we will also take a look on how members are nominated to the Raj Sabha itself. Now, first take a look at strength of Raj Sabha. The maximum strength of Raj Sabha is fixed at 250 seats, out of which 238 are to be representatives of the state and union territories and 12 are nominated by the President of India. However, at present, the strength of Raj Sabha is that of 245 members. Of these 245 members, 229 members represents the state, whereas 4 members represents union territories of our country. Further, 12 members are nominated by the President of India. It is the fourth schedule of our constitution that provides for allocation of Raj Sabha seats to the states and union territories. And these allocation of seats are done on basis of population of each states. For instance, there are 31 Raj Sabha seats in the state of Uttar Pradesh. Whereas, there is only one seat for state of Goa. 
Now out of India's union territories, only three of them, that is Delhi, Puducherry and JNK have representation in Raj Sabha. The population of other union territories are too small to have any representation in Raj Sabha. Now, Raj Sabha is a permanent house and hence it cannot be dissolved. Thereby, under Article 83 subsection 1, to ensure the continuity, one third of Raj Sabha members retire every second year. Hence, these biennial elections are there to fill vacancies and the term of every member is that of six years respectively. Also, vacancies arise due to resignation, death or disqualification and hence seats are filled through bipoles and those who are elected serve the Raj Sabha for the remainder of their predecessor's term. Also, elections are held only when there are more candidates than the vacancies. Otherwise, candidates are elected unopposed. Now, Raj Sabha MPs are elected through a process of indirect elections. As per Article 80, subsection 4 of the Constitution, it provides that the members of Raj Sabha are elected by elected members of state assembly through a system of proportional representation. And this is done by a means of single transferable vote. Further, as per Article 80, subsection 3, the 12 nominated members who have special knowledge or practical experience in matters of literature, science, art, etc. are nominated to Raj Sabha. A nominated member may then join a party within six months of taking his seat. The rationale behind the principle of nomination is to provide eminent person a place in Raj Sabha without going through process of election. This is all for today's discussion on Raj Sabha elections. Now moving on to the last article of the day which appeared on page 6 of today's Hindu newspaper. This article reports that seven products from the state of Uttar Pradesh has obtained geographical indicators tag. Now geographical indicators or GI tags form an important part of intellectual property regime in India. And this is an important topic from UPSC perspective as in GS paper 3 there is a topic related to issues with intellectual property rights. Further, in the mains of the year 2014, a question appeared on significance of intellectual property rights. Further, it also asked us to distinguish between copyrights, patents and trade secrets. Also, in the prelims of the year 2017, a question appeared on national intellectual property rights policy. Hence, in this regard, we will first take a look on what are GI tags and agencies which are responsible for administering the GI tag act of the year 1999. Further, we will take a look at seven products which got the GI tag from the state of Uttar Pradesh. Now a geographical indication or GI sign is used on products that have a specific geographical origin and they possess qualities or reputation that are due to that origin. Typically, such a name conveys an assurance of quality and distinctiveness which is an essential attribute to the fact of its origin in a defined geographical locality, region or country. Geographical indications are covered as an element of intellectual property rights under Article 1 and 10 of the Paris Convention for protection of industrial property. They are also covered under Article 22 to 24 of the trade related aspects of intellectual property rights also known as TRIPS agreement, which was part of agreements concluding the Uruguay rounds of G8 T negotiation. In India, geographical indication registration is administered by the geographical indication of goods Registration and Protection Act of the year of 1999. The Geographical Indication Registry in Chennai grants the GI tag in our country. And this is overseen by Controller General of Patents, Design and Trademarks which falls under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Now geographical indications are typically used for agriculture products, foodstuffs, wine and spirit drinks 
handicrafts and industrial products. Now let us take a look in products that have been highlighted in today's article. This article reports that the Geographical Indications Registry in Chennai has given tax to seven different products from Uttar Pradesh. The first is Amroha Dholak, which is a musical instrument made out of natural wood. Mango, jackfruit and teak wood are preferred for making such dholaks. Wood from mango and sesham trees are used to carve the multiple sized and hollow shaped blocks which are then later fitted with animal skin which is mostly goat skin to create this musical instrument. The second product was Bagpat Home Furnishing. Now Bagpat and Meerut are famous for their exclusive handloom home finishing products and running fabrics in cotton yarn generations and only cotton yarn are used in handloom weaving process. The third product is Barabanki Handloom and these products are around for many years and there are around 50,000 weavers and 20,000 looms at Barabanki and adjoining areas that specialize in making these particular handlooms. Now the fourth product is Kalpi Handmade Paper. Well details for Kalpi Handmade Paper show that Munna Lal who was a Gandhian formally introduced in this craft in 1940s. The handmade paper making cluster at Kalpi is a huge cluster which engages more than 5000 craftsmen and approximately 200 units. The fifth product is Mahoba Gora Pathar Hastslip which is a stone craft. It is a very unique and soft stone with scientific name of pyro flight stone. Now this Gora stone craft is made of radiant white colored stone that is predominantly found in the region and it is used for making craft items. Now the sixth item is Tarkashi which is a popular art form from the district of Manpuri. It is primarily a brass wire inlay work made on wood and it was mainly used for khadaus which are also wooden sandals and it was a necessity for every household since leather was considered unclean. The final product is Sambal Horncraft, the raw material for which is procured from dead animals and these crafts are handmade in nature. Hence, this is all for today's discussion on GI tags.